There's so much in the book of James about how we as Christ followers are to put our faith into practice in practical ways in our everyday lives. Uh, so I hope you'll be encouraged this morning as we continue with uh, chapter 2 of, uh, of the book of James. We're going to look at the first uh, 13 uh, verses together this morning. God's Word says this, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly... And a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, You sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, You stand over there or, or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are Poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones, are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor. As yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one or to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's pray again together. Father, help us as we look at your word this morning to hear you speaking to us individually through it. Help us to see your heart today. And Lord, change us so that our lives will be more like your heart. Help us to be like you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I was thinking about this as I was, this week as I was preparing uh, for this message, I was thinking about my middle school and high school years. Uh, maybe you would be thinking about those right now by me just mentioning it this morning in your own life, your middle school and high school years. I, I really have some great memories uh, from middle school and high school, uh, but I'm mostly just grateful that I'm no longer in middle school <laughs> or high school. Uh, there was a, an environment there uh, in those years that I've really been trying to escape ever since. And also, I've also been trying to rise above my own attitudes <laughs> uh, during those years. Um, this morning, we're going to be looking at the idea of partiality. And when I look at those years, those middle school and, and, and high school years, I see a lot of partiality happening. Those years were a study in how humans in, in, in their youngest forms position themselves by social standing, if you think about it. Social standing is everything in middle school and high school. It, it, it determines where you sit at lunch, right? I mean, you don't get to just go sit at whatever table you want to at middle school and high school. I mean, if you just show up at a certain table, you may be ushered away, <laughs> you know, from that table because you don't belong there. Social standing depends on, uh, uh, determines whether you date or not. In, in, in those years, and who you might date <laughs> if you do date in those years. And it, and it, and it determines how you are remembered. Th think about your high school yearbook. I actually have my middle school and high school yearbooks in a cabinet in my office here at the church, and that's because I, I decided to take up office space for them instead of taking up space in our house where we're, we're kind of limited in, in space for things like that. 
And every now and then, I'll just on a whim go grab one, go grab one and look at it, right? And in my high school uh, yearbook, uh, there was always that section that was devoted to class favorites. Maybe your yearbook had something similar to that, class favorites. And basically what that was, it was a celebration of the most popular and connected kids in the school. And so when I go back through the class favorites, I thought, oh, yeah, that, yeah I, I, I remember him. Yeah, I, I remember her. Yeah, they were the popular kids. They were the connected kids. And, and the people who were not on the class favorite list wanted to be on the class favorite list. That's what you wanted. You wanted to be one of the favorites. You wanted to be in that, in that group of people that were being celebrated because of their popularity. But what you didn't see in those class yearbooks was a section devoted to students that were really overlooked. And these are the students that if you go to the back of the yearbook, I don't know if your yearbook has like an index in it, where it's got the names of the students in the back and in the pages where they appear. Like, you know, one of those class favorites may have like, a, a, like three lines of pages where they're, they're, they show up somewhere in the yearbook. And then if you go into those yearbooks, and there's always those kids that only had like one page number by their name. And the reason was that for that was everybody was in there at least one time because they got their, their, their picture made, right? And their, their, their class picture was in the yearbook. But there were some kids where that's the only time they're even showing up in their yearbook. And, and, and think about it. I mean, we, we celebrated the class favorites, but we didn't celebrate the ones who were not popular, the ones who were not well-liked, the ones who had really serious social issues <laughs> and were socially awkward. We didn't celebrate them. We, 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 we didn't celebrate the kids that, that had absolutely no athletic ability whatsoever, whose parents grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. We didn't celebrate these kids at all. Yeah, I'm happy I'm not there anymore. <laughs> it's a brutal environment, if you think about it. I mean, I thought about, I mean, our kids have, have moved past that now. They're in college, but I was, sometimes I prayed for my kids. I thought, oh gosh, if it's anywhere near the way it was when I was there, and, and then I keep hearing people say, no, it's much worse now. <laughs> But some things may be better, some things may be worse, but I'm just so happy I'm not in that environment there anymore. And, and, but just so we can all be aware, these same attitudes still exist among us, even though we've escaped those intense years and maybe entered the adult world. And in fact, sometimes they make their way into the place that should be the last place they're present, the body of Christ the church. James opens our scripture today by saying this. He says, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So evidently there was a problem with this among the churches that, that he was addressing. And in, and in doing so, in addressing them, he's making the point that this kind of behavior should not be characteristic of Christians. The way the NIV translates the last part of that section is as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. What James is saying here is that Christianity and partiality are incompatible. They don't belong together. And, 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 and here's the statement that he makes that clearly defines the problem that existed. He says this, he says, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? These believers were making distinctions. They were preferring some people over others. And, and the problem that James is referring to here is illustrated by 
this hypothetical situation that he mentions, which might have actually been based on real occurrences, where two people come to church one day or come to the assembly. You know they didn't meet in a room like this, right? They didn't show up. They were in homes. So, so, so the assembly, wherever they were gathered, two people show up to that gathering. And one person is dressed really, really well. And the other person is dressed shabbily. <laughs> And the one who is dressed well is preferred to the one who is not. But the problem here that James is talking about goes deeper than simply judging by appearances. You know, on a first reading of this, you might be thinking, well, that they're judging on appearances. And that's right, they are. But you know, sometimes we judge by appearances and get it wrong. You see somebody who's covered in tattoos and you say, oh my goodness, look at that guy. He needs Jesus. But what you don't know is he's closer to Jesus than you are. He's living on fire for Jesus. And you look over here and here's somebody all just, I mean, just, just absolutely as clean cut as you could possibly imagine. I mean, they look like a Mormon missionary. And you assume, well, that's a good person. And they're living like the devil. We judge by outward appearances and we get it wrong many, many times. But the problem here isn't judging by outward appearances. That's bad enough. The problem is why they were judging, the conclusions that they were coming to about the people, actually in this case would have been right. One was rich, one was poor. The problem wasn't that they were judging by the outward appearances. The problem was they were valuing some people over others. They were valuing the rich person who in this case was dressed well and looked rich and was rich. And they were not valuing the poor person, who in this case was dressed poor and was poor. You see, it wasn't about the judgment based on appearances that was the problem. It was the fact that even when they got it right about the appearances, they were valuing somebody over the other. This is a really big problem here. This is a problem in, in, in the church that, that James is, is, is addressing here. And so for our purposes today, we're going to use this definition for partiality. That word's going to come up a lot this morning. So what are we talking about when we talk about partiality as it relates to our passage today? That means this, favoritism shown on the basis of status in society. And the practice of partiality has a strong effect on our faith and on our witness. And it says much about our own spiritual condition. I love what Warren Wiersbe says about this. He says, the way we behave toward people indicates what we really believe about God. And that was what was going on here in the church that James is addressing. Remember, the, the whole title of this whole series of messages is Practical Belief. Well... James is expressing that the way they're behaving towards people is revealing what they really believe about God here. And the fact is, Christianity and partiality should not mix. And here are a few reasons why, based on what James is talking about here. First, why Christianity and partiality should not mix. First, partiality is common. It's common. Last week, we looked at these words in James 1.27, where he says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and then that last phrase, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And right away, James jumps into this discussion how the, of how the church is in danger of being stained by the world as they are making these distinctions based on social standing. Hear this. Things like prejudice, making distinctions, and favoritism is and always has been the way of the world. This is how the world operates. This is common to the world's way of doing things. These things are not new. They existed long before you were in middle school or you were in high school, and they've defined history in many ways. They've defined cultures. 
these kinds of practices like partiality. And, and sometimes society has moments of nobility where people rise above these things. Like Hurricane Harvey when the, the whole city of Houston is just valuing all life and everybody's just coming together, black and white, Latino, everybody's together and, and the, 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 the country's looking at Houston and saying, look at how diverse that place is and look at how together they are. Sometimes we, society rises above these things, but they're always there and they always reveal themselves again. It's the way of the world and Christians are to be separate from the way of the world. But it's not just rich people who are guilty of partiality. That's really not what James is showing us here. All people, rich and poor, and all those in between, are likely to fall into this kind of behavior. Think about what James is saying here and who James is saying it to. James is not speaking to a group of wealthy believers. It's not who he's talking to. Listen, in that day the church was made up of, of all classes of people. But in many cases, the majority of the people were poor. And notice what he says here. James says, are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court. Now he's addressing the people and he's basically talking about the rich, but what he's saying is, you're not the rich. <laughs> it's the rich are the ones who are oppressing you, the ones who drag you into court. James is acknowledging that the problem here was with people who were not rich who were showing partiality. It was people who were not rich who were treating some people well and some people not so well. This kind of behavior is common among all people, and we can all fall into it. Listen, people take a certain degree of comfort in the thought that there are those who are lower than them. And quite frankly, they really hope it stays that way. That's the world's way. I'm going to get in a whole lot of trouble about what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway because it really makes my point. So forgive me, because I'm going to go both ways, so don't worry. But in Alabama, we were always happy there was a Mississippi. And I'm sure in Mississippi, they were always happy there was an Alabama. Because we could always look at one place and say, at least we're not them. And that's human nature. Human nature is, at least I'm not the lowest of the low. At least there's a low below me. And by the way, as long as still, there's still the below then I'm not there. So that's good. But if, if you remove them, I might go lower. It's, I don't think I want to go lower. It, it's human nature. Yeah, I've been thinking about this in relation to these things. Uh, kind of as a student of, of, of history, and, and I've done a lot, of, a lot of reading about the Civil War, I've, I've often wondered why poor Southerners fought in the Civil War. Because they didn't own slaves, right? I can understand why the rich plantation owners wanted there to be a war, because they wanted to continue their, their livelihood in that sense. But why did the poor Southerners fight and give their lives in defense of what they understood as being protecting their way of life? Well, here's, here's a pretty good theory that I've heard about that, and it's this. Poor Southerners were optimistic people. They looked at the society they lived in and they said, one day I can be like that rich plantation owner. And I want to maintain that hope. And so as long as things stay the way they are, there's always a chance for me to be a rich plantation owner one day and kind of what goes with that is owning slaves. You see, even the poor folks made distinctions in that sense and didn't value folks who we're of a different skin color, it's all in this property. That one day maybe I can have property like that. So I'm going to fight a war to maintain that system of, of living so that one day that possibility might be available to me. Listen, listen, partiality is common. But we're called by our Lord to be uncommon. 
As believers in Jesus Christ, he wants us to be different. But another reason why Christianity and partiality should not mix is this. Partiality is blatantly ungodlike. And I'm not even sure if that's the right way to say it, but it just sounded good this week. It's ungodlike partiality. And here are a few quick examples of how the Bible reveals this. Remember when Peter had the vision uh, of the unclean animals, and that was God's way of revealing to him that God wanted Gentiles to be his people too, not just the, the Jews. And notice what Peter says after this experience in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 10. Peter makes this statement. It says, Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And then Paul, in the book of Romans, is making the case for why both Jews and Gentiles alike are going to be judged for their wickedness. Paul makes this simple statement in Romans 2. He says, For God shows no partiality. And even Jesus' worst critics, the religious leaders, approached him one day by acknowledging a certain truth about him. In Matthew 22, we read this. Teacher, they said, we know that you are truthful and teach truthfully the way of God. You don't care what anyone thinks, nor do you show partiality. Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, who is God's ultimate way of revealing himself to mankind, was one who did not show partiality. And here in our passage today, James says this. He says, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Now the point he's making is not that God's going to save the poor and send the rich to hell. That's not what he's saying here. But what he is saying is that the poor are those who've already realized their need for God. Or they're, they're likely to, have, to be in a place where because they're not... They're not wealthy in, in earthly terms. They recognize their need, and maybe that helps, helps move them towards God and being in a position of humility to receive God's salvation when it's offered through Jesus. And it also means that God, in choosing the poor in that way, is showing that what the world despises, He views differently. Now, that's an important thought. I'm sorry, just, just a moment. You. I need you to go back. Go back. No, no, back. No, no. No, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, that's better. Janie, come back in here, please. Okay, Janie, thank you. Everybody give Janie a hand for playing along this morning. Please, please. Oh, no, Janie has to leave. She actually does have to leave. But I told you, you've got to come back in to get me off the hook. So she has to go help set up for the lunch afterwards. So she's, she's leaving now. She's fulfilled her purpose. Okay, that was unsettling, wasn't it? And some of you probably knew I was up to something that had to do with my sermon, but some of you were not so sure. And yes, I primed, primed Gary before because I want to make sure Gary knew ahead of time because I didn't want Gary to bow up on me this morning as he rightfully would have. We all love Janie. She came to mind this week when I was thinking about doing this. And here's why we did that. Janie is dear to us. We love her. The thought of us casting her out of this room just is appalling, right? That's how God feels about the people that the world despises, including some of the people that you and I despise. The way you feel about Janie and felt about Janie in that moment is how God feels about those that the world overlooks and rejects and pushes to the side. How did that make you feel? 
See, I've seen it the other way, right? I've, I've heard the, the illustration of the pastor shows up dressed like a poor guy. He's kind of in disguise and people treat him, uh, treat him badly. And then it, all of a sudden they introduce the pastor and he comes forward and everybody's like, oh my gosh, we should have treated him better. But see, this is the other side of that, right? This is okay. He, he's the pastor, so we should treat him well. No, here's the thought. Think about how God views those folks who are the least of these and compare that with how you felt for Janie and realize God loves those folks a lot more than you love Janie. So I hope it unsettled you just a little bit. And I'm thankful that nobody rioted or threw, came up here and put me in ch chains or something to get to control me because there was method to the madness there. But think about that. Think about this. Hear this. God values everyone, including those the world rejects. So what is the value? What is the value that God places on every person? It's very simple. It's the life of Jesus Christ who died for them. That's how much God values every person. And this is why partiality is so ungodlike, because it's the opposite of the cross. This is God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Listen, sometimes our prayer can be this simple. God, help me see others the way you do. Help me see illegal immigrants the way you do. Help me see Democrats the way you do. Help me see Aggies or Longhorns the way you do. Now that's all, that last part's silly. First part, not so much. Who is it that you despise or maybe even that are, are repulsed by them? Is it somebody who practices a gay lifestyle? Does that repulse you? And the thought of sitting next to them somewhere give you the heebie-jeebies? Or are you seeing them how God sees them? I'm not saying behavior is right or wrong. I'm just saying, how does God see people? People that are despised by others, people that are shoved aside, people that sometimes the church, yes, us, is likely to devalue because we're putting less value on them than we are others. Lord, help me see others the way you do. Christianity and partiality should not mix because partiality is blatantly ungodlike. But one more thing, also this, partiality is a sin. It's a sin. James says this, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Listen, to show favoritism towards those who are socially higher and to devalue those who are socially lower is sin. It's exactly what it is, and it's a, it's a big deal. It's breaking God's clear commandment about loving our neighbor, which in God's eyes is not limited to a certain type of person. We do like the religious leaders, and we try to qualify. Well, who is my neighbor? God says, look around you. Anybody you come in contact with is, is, is your neighbor. It doesn't matter what their bank account says. It doesn't matter what their skin looks like. It doesn't matter if they're male or female, young or old. They're your neighbor. Love them. Love them. And so partiality is breaking that commandment. And it also reveals something about us. Hear this. Partiality is pure selfishness. It proclaims, I love myself more than my neighbor. You say, wait a minute, maybe you got that wrong, Pastor. Don't you mean you, I love the rich person more than? No. What it really says is, I love myself more than I love my neighbor. Notice what James says here. This little phrase here, here, he says, if you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing. Now that phrase, if you pay attention, 
really means to give special attention. It's not just mere acknowledgement. It's like giving that person the VIP treatment, right? And think about how businesses like hotels operate. You have somebody wealthy coming into town. What do they do? They give them the VIP treatment. They put them in the best room. They make sure that they have all the, uh, all the attention they need as far as, uh, you know, making sure their room is clean, making sure if they need anything that somebody's Johnny on the spot to get it for them. They go over the top to woo and to, to care for that person who's their VIP. Is that because they just really think wealthy people are cool and fun to be around? No, it's because they want their business. They want the wealthy people to keep coming to their hotel, pouring their money into the hotel, inviting their friends to do the same. That hotel knows that by treating that wealthy person well, they will get something from it. That's what it's all about. And that's why you and I show partiality to some people. You and I show partiality to some people is because we want something from them. Something that we value about them, we want to get from them. And that's why we reject others. We reject others because we feel that they have nothing to offer us. They have nothing to offer what we're doing. So why pay them any attention? They're no good to us. That sounds sinful, doesn't it? Because it is. It's, it's, it's right at the heart of sin, the root of sin, selfishness. And it's the opposite of Jesus. The opposite of Jesus. Who said about himself, I did not come to serve, to be served, but to serve. He said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm going to die for those who have nothing to give me. I'm going to give my all to the ones who offer me nothing. Pure, complete self-sacrifice. And that's why Christianity and partiality are incompatible. Now bringing all this together as we kind of come to the end here. What do we do about this? The good news is, is I don't feel like I serve in a church that has major, major partiality issues. <laughs> you know, we, I trust the hearts of, of the people here and I know that the hearts of the people here are whosoever will may come, right? Our doors are open. And we want to treat someone who may be, give us the perception of being lowly as well as we treat somebody who may give us the perception of being wealthy and so forth and so on. But we still have to be aware of this. It does creep into our lives. It creeps into our society. It's in our society and anything that's in our society can creep in to us. We've got to be careful about that. We can't trust society to see folks the same way God sees them. That's where we should be. We should be the ones who know the mind of Christ. We should be the ones who have, the, have God's heart about people. And we should be the ones that are uncommon where that's concerned. We should be the ones that say that person has value even if society is saying they don't. And because Jesus died for you and he died for me and because we had nothing to give him, nothing to offer him, and we see that God valued us that much to send Christ to die for us, then we should be the people of all the people in the world who says we value everyone and see them as an object of God's love and as a potential object of his love through us to them. That's what it means for us as a church. What does it mean for you as a family? You know, sometimes we... We kind of get wrapped up in ours, right? Our people all the time. There's not room for others who don't fall in that 
circle. And you need your time, right? I mean, you need your time as your family to connect and so forth and so on. But sometimes God's word can cause us to examine our family life and say, are we being partial in our treatment of other people? You know, I, I trust God's word enough to know that at this point I can just stop talking and let him take over as far as the rest of this. But I do ask you to open up your heart and mind right now and say, God, show me my heart. God, am I willing and wanting to see people the way you see them? Or am I still holding on to prejudice? Am I still holding on to attitudes that reveal that there's selfishness in me that favors some people over others? I challenge you to be open and honest with God this morning on that point. I challenge you to understand and know that as a follower of Jesus Christ, partiality is not who you are. And it's not who you should be.